It's not about, it's not about, it's not about the injury. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about the injury. It's about the recovery. It's about the recovery. Hi, folks. This is Paul Pata with the Paul Pata Podcast here with you for another exciting episode coming to you from Red Chimp Studios. Today, my guest is Tony Abitangelo, attorney extraordinaire, all around <laughs> great guy, Mr. Las Vegas. Yes. I think of you as Mr. Las Vegas because you, you, you were born and raised here. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever met a person in this town who knows more people, Tony, than you do. Well, how's that possible? Well, I'm the kid you went to high school with. <laughs> That talked to everybody. Yeah. Didn't matter who you had money, if you were broke, if you were smart, or you weren't such a good student. Mm -hmm. And I got all kinds of examples. Um, yeah, so I talked to everybody. So I, I was always nice and uh, to people and you know help people out. And one of my best compliments I had is when people said, "Hey, I was at a fundraiser or a party. I didn't know anybody, and you came up and talked to me oh. and tried to make me feel welcome." Well, I gotta tell you, you do have that personality. You're very engaging, and you're very easy to talk to. My God, you could be like a marital counselor or something. <laughs> a shrink, maybe. Yes, I have enough issues. I can pass on <laughs> that professional help. Well, well you, you, so you're part of my law firm, Paul Pata Law, where you do personal injury. Now you're also a part of a, uh, an affiliate firm called the Vegas Lawyers, where you do criminal defense. So you're an interesting person because you do both criminal and personal injury. There are not a lot of lawyers in this town that do both or do them well, and you do both of those very well. So the Vegas Lawyers, I understand, is uh, a new, t tell me more about that firm. Well, first of all, when you came up with that idea, I said I loved it because I was born here. And actually, when I went to school in San Diego, and this was in the 80s, the famous Fabulous Las Vegas sign, yes. they started calling me Mr. Vegas, Mr. Well, actually, I was Mr. Fabulous. My roommate had a 69 Cadillac, mm -hmm. And the license plate was Mr. Vegas. Mr. Vegas. So it was Mr. <laughs> Fabulous and Mr. Vegas. So I'm like, I love it because yeah. Vegas, especially back then, had such a flair. Yes. Because other states didn't allow gambling back then. And the UNLV rebels, we were rebels. You know, we were not, you know, we were out of the main progeny of life and Jerry Tarkanian. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, his son George was a year ahead of me mm -hmm. in high school and Danny was a senior when I was a freshman and Danny went to University of San Diego Law School when I was an undergrad there. So, you know, there it was a small town. Yeah. And so the Vegas lawyers, I love that image, but my dad was a lawyer. So I grew up in the law mm -hmm. and I loved what I do. Mm -hmm. And we handle all kinds of cases from traffic tickets all the way up to murder cases. Yeah. And and you're the king of DUIs too. Well, not forgetting them, but for defending them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> yes, and um Flavor well, Flav, wasn't he one of your former clients? He was clients? one of my clients. Okay, he was not so charged with a DUI. Yeah. So yeah, you run into people and you grow up with people and they introduce you to these people and it's it's great energy of people that are good people yeah. that have a bad day or make a mistake. Yeah. You know, there's people that make mistakes that aren't running around shoving guns in people's faces and have been to prison four or five times. Yeah. Good people make mistakes. That's true. And that's where we come into play, as well as for people that are more difficult past. And we do our best. And we approach a criminal case here at the Vegas Lawyers with every angle possible. Mm -hmm. From, hey, let's get you into a rehab. And I've got people that I've known who have started rehab places. Yeah and they want to get people better. Um, and speaking of DUIs, when I was a Justice of the Peace in 2004, I was the first judge in the state of Nevada to have a DUI court program certified uh, by the National Association of uh, Specialty Courts Association mm -hmm. as a true DUI court. There was one in district court. That was the first in Las Vegas. In, uh, in Nevada. Wow. And uh, it's now called the Moderate Defender Program. Okay. And we evolved it. We started getting grants. Eventually, I started teaching at the uh, national level from sustainability to practices. And uh, we put a lot of time into that. 
court. So what do you, I mean, so safe to say you, you, you are the expert on DUIs. You've, you were the j chief judge of the court and you probably saw so many DUIs come through your court. Right. What, what are your, some, some of your main observations over all those years? Well, there's, the nice thing about being a judge is you get to watch also other attorneys. As the old saying goes, God gave us two ears and one mouth, so be quiet and listen, right? <laughs> That's a good so line. I like John that. John Watkins, who uh -huh. actually, who I do, who's now retired, who I, for yeah. the most part, retired, who I did call the king of DUIs. He's an, he's an amazing lawyer. Because that's all he did was DUIs, and yeah. he worked for my dad in the yeah. 80s. Okay. So I would watch him come in. Yeah. Uh, new lawyers, lawyers on the up and coming, and I could name a bunch that are excellent DUI lawyers, mm -hmm. and I watched them practice as well as prosecutors. So I know the ins, the outs, and I know how to properly utilize the court's time, the DA's time, and the defense's time to get the best negotiation, because okay. 98% of all cases, civil and criminal, resolve without a trial. That's true. Um, or if we need to, let's go to the, let's, as we say, let's tee it up. Yeah. Let's put this on and do a trial. So what, what are the two biggest defenses in a DUI case? I would imagine, number one, is whether the police had probable cause to pull the person over. And number two, does the person's blood alcohol content you know, meet the standard level? And if it does, there's really not a lot to fight about after that point, right? Well, and that's where I tell people, actually, there's four main elements of a DUI. Okay, I stand corrected. Yeah. I no, but know. there's two, a couple of main issues like you're mentioning. Number one is what you said. Is there probable cause to stop you? Because mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a DUI or a drug search. If they don't have probable cause, they being the police, we're going to get that case beat or favorable res resolution. Yeah. So there's got to be probable cause for the police to stop you. Okay. As I was lightheartedly telling a guy the other day, well, when you're at the red light and it turns green and it turns red and it turns green <laughs> and it turns red and somebody calls the police, they come up to you and you're sleeping in the middle of the, in your car in the middle of the road, that's probable cause. That's probable cause, yeah. <laughs> And I don't know how people's feet stay on the brake, but yeah. they do. Okay. Um, then number two is an element that doesn't work as well because as time has progressed, the DAs have figured it out and the prosecution figured it out is, are you in actual physical control of the vehicle? Hmm. And actual physical control is not just sitting behind the wheel like a traditional speeding and you get stopped. Yeah. But you get outside the car, you're changing a tire. When I was a baby lawyer back in the early 90s, that was a winner. Yeah. You were done. Okay. We had a reckless all day or even better. Mm -hmm. Now it's, was anybody else at the scene? What was your admission? Mm. Oh. Because the officer can say, what, is that, what happened here? Why are you outside your car? Oh, I was driving and got a flat tire. Well, your admission is a statement, as you know, from your years of practice, comes in as evidence. Mm -hmm. So they utilize that against you. Yeah. So that element of being actual physical control isn't as much of a defense as it used to be. So, so if a police officer pulls you over for uh, suspicion of DUI and they tell you, well, we want you to take the field sobriety test, what should a person's response to that be? My opinion is you don't have to take the field sobriety test because there's no consequence. Yeah. So, for example... Uh, and frankly, uh, if I could interject, yeah, just ask, unless you're an Olympic gymnast, you're probably going to fail that test anyways, right? Well, back in my drinking days, we used to practice at the bar. <laughs> you know, we had that foot up there and uh, we practiced. Cause, you know, just in case. Just yeah. in case, yeah. right? But it's, uh, you know, one of them, the first test they do is the standard, you know, where they do this with the pen. Yeah. The horizontal gaze and stagmus test. Mm -hmm. That's very subjective. Yeah, of course. And here's a funny story. Uh, recently, you know, as you know, I had eye issues. I was at the ophthalmologist, and he got stopped for a DUI. He goes, I hadn't been drinking. And he goes, I started questioning the cop about the way he was making me follow the pen. He, I told him that wasn't accurate. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine a nightmare of a cop right. stopping around. <laughs> You an, know, optometrist. an optometrist yeah. or ophthalmologist. But the field sobriety test, there's no adverse consequence. But there is an adverse consequence for what's called the preliminary breath test. Mm. The PBT, taken in the field is when you blow in the machine. It can only be used for probable cause purposes. It's not a certified test, so it doesn't come in as proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And they can, the police can use that, the prosecution can use that to continue to stack the pieces against you. I see. But if you don't take the PBT, then you lose your license for one year, mm. which in Nevada, or at least Vegas, is a problem mm -hmm. because of the lack of public transportation. Yeah. So field sobriety tests, I tell people, 
there's no reason to take it. Preliminary breath test, you better take it because mm -hmm. that's a really tough penalty if you lose. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, if you don't. So what, what, is the, what are the odds that someone's going to go to jail over a first-time DUI offense? Well, going to jail initially is yes. Okay. And for years since I've been back in private practice. That's not scary. Yeah. Well, because you're going to get arrested, they're going to take you to the jail. Okay. They're going to tell you to do a blood or a breath test. But you buy it, so basically, probably like a couple of days, right? We're not talking like a year or something. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. So you'll be released, I would tell people, I tell people eight to 24 hours. But one thing they do, in by law, is at the jail, you have to blow into like a PBT, a preliminary mm -hmm. breath test. And that is not submitted as evidence. And yet once you're below, I think a .02 or .03 or below, they'll release you. Mm -hmm. So if you're really smashed out of your mind, you might be in there for 24, 28 hours, 30, because yeah. you're so high on your blood alcohol level. Mm -hmm. If you were real low, you know, they'll pop you out of there. Okay. They want to get people like that, nonviolent offenders, out of the jails. Now, most DUIs are misdemeanors, is that correct? First and second offenses within seven years are misdemeanors. What, what if you caught, what if it's, it's a first time offense, you cause a car accident, and the person is injured in the other car? Can, can that be bumped up to a felony? Absolutely. Oh, the, wow. One of the tough statutes on the criminal side, the defense side, is, and it's, I love the number, NRS.060. <laughs> it's, it's one of the first statutes. It's a definition of substantial bodily harm. Mm. Substantial bodily harm section one is what people traditionally think of. Broken bones, mayhem, disfigurement, all kinds of stuff that really is crazy. Mm -hmm. That you would go, yeah, that makes sense. But subsection two says, Prolonged physical pain. Yeah. So, you know, like in our personal injury cases, you got a sore neck, whiplash for a day. Mm -hmm. You've had pain for 24 hours. That could count as prolonged physical pain. Yeah. And the big picture is they also, uh, the DAs also take that into account. So we, we got lucky on a recent case. There was very serious car damage by two cars. Our client had a .05, so he's below the legal limit. However, you know, we're waiting to find out what happened to this guy. He went to the hospital. But luckily, he, the, the injured person only had basically soft tissue injuries. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to the prosecutor, he said, look, you know, as we went back and forth, he goes, I judge this on broken bones. I judge this on, you know, like severe lacerations if you need 15, 20 stitches on your cheek. Right. He goes, I'm, I'm going to go with that. He said, fortunately for you, Tony, and your client, he just really had soft tissue injuries. But then we put in the other factors of the car insurance, the settlements, things of that nature. And we took a multifaceted approach to it. And uh, we got him a misdemeanor reckless. Oh, that's he was a great charged result. With, he's yeah. charged with felony reckless driving. That's a big deal. Oh, it was. I mean, the difference between having a felony on your record versus a misdemeanor, that's a life altering type of dif distinction. And this young man is in his early 20s and is an international student yeah. at UNLV in the hospitality program. And he could have got deported. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. So uh, we got a very favorable resolution. We're trying to wrap it up now. and uh, But that's where you have to take that look of the substantial bodily harm. And that's why also at the Vegas Lawyers, I always tell people, I wish I didn't meet you in the, under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. Take an Uber. Take a lift. Yeah. Let somebody else drive. Yeah. You know, it, it's you could not only harm yourself but somebody else, right. and you have to live with that guilt. That's right. And that, let alone ruining your life with a felony in your 20s or whatever, and it's a very difficult situation. Yeah. But one of the things I wanted to swing back to is one of the things you stated is what is the blood alcohol level mm -hmm. or breath alcohol level? Yes. If it's 0.08 or above, you're hit with a DUI. Now the test has. A little variance in there. So if you're right at 0 .08, 0 .09, depending on your prosecutor, the fight could be on. If not, you might just get the uh, reckless. Hmm. It just really depends. Okay. Um, you know, but I was also telling some people we work with that DUIs is a lot. It's a whole different world than when my dad was practicing or in the early 90s. Yeah. Literally. Hey, Mr. Prosecutor Pata. Look, the guy was nice to the officer, Officer Smith. Yeah, he was nice. Give him a reckless. Yeah. Nobody was injured. Everybody's nice. Those days are gone, so I still get those questions. Well, I think there's a lot of pressure on the police, on the DA's <laughs> office, that if, you know, you show this leniency and a person later goes and kills someone, well, look, you, you had an opportunity to prosecute him. 
mothers against drunk driving. I mean, it's become a big issue. Absolutely. And it's not to be taken lightly. And we've seen too many tragic situations where, you know, good people got behind the wheel when they shouldn't have, caused someone else's death. It's a tragedy all the way around. Not only has that person ruined their own life, and now they have to live with the guilt of uh, having killed somebody. Right, and then that family's lost a member. And believe me, I've been on the defense side as well as the judicial side, where everybody's got their T-shirts, yeah. their loved ones deceased. And it's one of those situations where everybody loses. Yeah. The f victim and their family's lost, potentially Las Vegas lost a good person. Um, you know, the defendant's losing out on things. Sure. And, and, and that's why it's really an avoidable crime. But once again, that still brings up a topic of, a, of dealing with some of these prosecutors and judges saying, hey, your guy already had a prior DUI. Mm -hmm. And he didn't learn his lesson. Or she didn't learn her lesson. And, you know, the hammer comes down a little stiffer. Sure. A little tougher. So, you know, there's lots of things like that that you have to consider when you're looking at a DUI. Now, I've heard if you have two drinks... That's usually not going to be enough to get you uh, a DUI. Is that true? I mean, I, these numbers get thrown around, but does it really? I guess it depends on a person's size, their body weight, that sort of thing. You're right, right on target. Uh, my studies that I've read, as well as when I was a judge, I had to go to judicial college, and we had a young man and a young woman sit down with a bottle of wine and drink while we were getting lectured to. They're in the back, you know. They're like, "Hi, I'm so and so. Hi, I'm so and so." You know, an hour later, like, hey, you know, they get the buzz on. And so we saw it, and they did the breath tests and all that stuff in front of us. Mm. Um, and what happens is, basically, the first hour, sure, you could have two drinks. Second hour is one drink okay. per hour. But on the other side, a person that weighs 100 pounds is going to be affected differently than a person that's 200 pounds. A mm -hmm. person in their 20s with good metabolism. Is different than a person in their 50s or 60s. Yeah. So there's a lot of variables. And you know, what about drinking the water in between the drinks? Well, that does help with uh, diluting the alcohol, but it also, you know, hydrates you because that's part of a hangover. Mm -hmm. But that helps the hangover more than it does your blood alcohol level. Yeah. And that's why there's a two-hour rule, okay. which we look at. And I tell clients, give me a copy of your cell phone records if you got stopped and called somebody. I've caught police fudging, I'll say, mm. the time records. Mm. And, but you know, I get pulled over, hey Paul, it's Tony, I'm getting stopped by the cops, I'm not gonna be over, or hey, be ready to pick me up, my car, do something, help yeah. me. And I match up phone records. I see. Now, and I say this respectfully, and thankfully, most of the time the police are telling the truth. Because mm -hmm. that's what we want in our society. Yeah, of course. We don't want police running around lying and right. fudging facts when they, when they know the rules like yeah. we do. So, you know, I get it, and we use it. If not, we don't use it. It just depends if it's beneficial. So you're saying the police have to administer a blood draw or a breath test within two hours of stopping you? Correct. I see. Now, that does not apply to drugs. Okay. And drugs, obviously, is only the blood test. Yeah. And uh, to stay focused on the alcohol, that's right in the statute, two-hour rule. And, you know, I've got a guy, uh, or we have here at the Vegas Lawyers, somebody that's a .24. Three wow. times the legal limit. Oh my goodness! But the blood draw, blood draw is way past the point, uh, way past the two hours, mm -hmm. and there are multiple factors that are involved, including having a clean record, yeah. including not being in a car crash, therefore nobody's hurt, and there are more factors I could go into that got us a reckless driving, but you know there were some other heavy fines imposed because with the relationships I have with the prosecutors mm -hmm. of being straight and fighting as well. Yeah. We worked out a negotiation with both sides could live with. I, I've seen the juice you have. They treat you like they're, you're, you're, you're a buddy of theirs. You walk into court and everybody's like, hey, there's Tony. <laughs> well, the judges, a, the prosecutors. Once again, I went to high school. <laughs> I'm the guy you went Mostly. to high school to talk to everybody. And that's just it. And yeah. that's where they also understand when I know I got a slam dunk loser case, yeah. I don't do stupid things. Oh. And that's where our clients benefit. Yeah. Because there's certain attorneys that everything's a fight. Right. And they're not respected. And the client comes out worse in the end. They do. They get hammered. You saw it as a prosecutor. Attorney gets to go home and say, well, I did the best I could for you. I'm sorry you got screwed by the prosecutor. When in reality, you know. They're pissed at you. They're pissed at you, <laughs> yeah. Well, and you saw it as a prosecutor. You saw it as a defense attorney. But there's certain people that are just fighting everything. Yeah. Stupid things. Yeah. I, 
And it was funny, actually, here at the Vegas Lawyers on a murder case. Uh, we had an associate, our old friend Josh Ang, mm -hmm. filed about 10 motions in limine. And by the time it got down to like the ninth motion, the DA was so mad at me. And I've known him forever. Uh -huh. He goes, I, I said to Josh, I said, right in front of the prosecutor, I said, this is what happens when you've agitated the DA. Because yeah. he started getting a little personal, but yeah. not too much, because we're still, you know, we're still, even though we're opponents, we still sure. have respect. But even, I, I could tell you were agitated. He was, I was ready to strangle you. But, you know, we laughed about yeah. it. We moved on, because he knew we were also doing our job. Well, I we think weren't just filing frivolous motions. Yes, and I think a lot of clients, they see an attorney who they think is fighting in court, and they think, oh, that's a good, he's a fighter. Or an attorney thinks that that's what the client wants to see. But in reality, you can fight in a smart way by killing them with kindness, too, and, and get a better deal or a better result. Well, one of the classic stories I have is after I left the bench, a guy comes to me with his daughter. She stole some items from a friend. So I called the prosecutor up and after looking at the evidence. I said, besides my client's former friends calling the police and reporting her items stolen, besides the police running a pawn check and the finding those items, and then her former friends identifying those items as hers, besides the pawn shop having my client's driver's license and her pawning those items, <laughs> and then when the police talked to my client and she confessed and had the pawn tickets mm -hmm. in her purse, you've got no case, Yeah. right? I mean, I have nothing to work with. Right. So we used a defense which uh, was valid mm -hmm. and true, and she had a gambling problem. Okay. And she started doing Gambling Anonymous. She took not only classes, but she went to a, a respected uh, psychologist and counselor here, and she worked the program. Hmm. And she had a clean record. And we got a very favorable negotiation. Because once again, my back's against the wall. I've got nothing. Yeah. So what do I do? Well, what do most people want in the judicial system? They don't want these people to return. Yeah. So let's get her help and address the root of the problem. Right. So we present every, we look at every possible angle, defense, and way to approach yeah. a case here at the Vegas Lawyers. So, okay, somebody's watching the show, they leave work today, they go to a happy hour with their colleagues, they're having right. a few drinks, they're on their way home now, and they get pulled over. What's your advice to them as a DUI lawyer? Straight up. Do not admit you were drinking or doing drugs because guess what they're going to do? They being the police. Step out of the car. So when you say don't admit, you're not telling people to lie, but you're saying you don't need to admit to anything. Correct, yes. Uh, because what every officer says in their report on a DUI, and I've been doing this for 30 years, I smelled an unknown odor of alcoholic beverage about his, his or her breath. They had bloodshot, watery, maybe droopy eyes. Yeah. Uh, they st I asked them to step out of the car. Before they stepped out of the car, they fumbled through their registration insurance. <laughs> and lastly, once they did get out of the car, they were unsteady on their gait or foot. Yeah. You know, that is just rubber stamp. It's, yeah. like, it's like it's you know, already ink stamped and they just put it in. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to admit you were drinking. Don't be a jerk either because the police got power. Oh, yeah. So you just say, instead of saying I'm not going to answer that, just say no. I mean, I joke around with people. If you got a joint in your mouth and a heroin needle in your arm and a bottle of jack in your hand, have you been drinking and doing drugs? Nope, not me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but just be polite always because the yeah. police have the power. That's right. Then you do not have to do the field sobriety test. Some people that feel they have good agility can say they do. I mean, want to take them. If you don't, they ask you numerous questions and tell the police, I've had a surgery, I've done this, I'm not gonna take the test, that's fine. If they say you wanna take the preliminary breath test, absolutely, you have to take that, otherwise you lose your license for a year. Mm. And then when you go down to the jail, people ask all the time, blood or breath? They're the same, they're both yeah. about the same with accuracy. Yeah. If you wanna delay, if you know you're really drunk or been drinking too much, and you wanna delay the losing of your driver's license, take the blood test. Mm. It takes anywhere from two to six months okay. to get the results back. If you do a breath test, they don't write that. Hmm. And then what happens is you have a week to get your driver's license, which is called a temporary driver's license, mm -hmm. which we set up and we do that here for the person that needs it. And you know we start the administrative process as well. Interesting. Yeah. So th that's what I tell people is don't admit it. Yeah. Because then you're out of the car and you already got problems. Then you're done. Yeah. 
Tony, this has been so educational and informative. Thank you so much. I hope I never need your services, but if I do, <laughs> I know exactly who to call. That's right. Uh, so anyways, thank you so much for educating everybody about DUIs. This is really important to understand the ins and outs. And uh, you're a great attorney, and I know uh, definitely you'll keep doing what you're doing. And I love what I do. I love being a lawyer, and I love being in the fight. So uh, my pleasure being here. Thank you. We'll do well, the fist bump. That's right. All right. Well, folks, that's a wrap for another episode of the Paul Pata Podcast. Today, we've had Tony Abitangelo, DUI lawyer extraordinaire, educate us about DUIs. Uh, it's been really informative and educational. Stay safe out there. Drive safely. And until next time, I'll see you then. Take care.